Stephen is Associate Professor of Sociology and Assistant Director of Humanities at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Um, today he will talk about filmmaking and the politics of remoteness and present the case of the FOGO process. Uh -huh. I'll just be one second. No, and... Sure. Thanks. Um, my sense is that the sound is very bad on the microphone and that uh, it might be better for me to just speak without the microphone. Can you hear me without the microphone? It's better with the microphone? Okay, because I found that it's kind of dulling out the range of speech and it's sometimes hard to hear what people are saying. Uh, well, I'm Stephen Crocker. I'm from uh, Memorial University in Newfoundland. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about the background of what I'm going to speak about. Um, Newfoundland is, until recently, a remote part of Canada. It joined Canada in 1949. Um, <clears throat> when it joined Canada, it became part of the Canadian welfare state, and there were many attempts to integrate Canada, uh, Newfoundland into the Canadian welfare state and subject it to various projects of modernization and so on. Uh, some of these involve very interesting uses of what's now called participatory media or social media, and I'll talk about one of those today. So I'm interested in these early experiments from the late 60s, uh, partly just because they took place in a place that I'm from, that they occurred there in Newfoundland, they're an important part of our history, but also because they're important archival documents of early attempts to use film to promote social change. Um, and so the kind of experiment that went on in Fogo Island, which I'll describe now, was very interesting because they were not just trying to use film to represent an already existing community to get people's views out, but they were trying to use film to actually create community, to create collectivity through the process of filmmaking. So it's a very interesting moment in the history of film and in the origins of ideas of participatory media and how people could participate in media and therefore become politicized and become collective and overcome their separation from one another and so on. They're often seen as the background of early kinds of user-generated uh, media and the kinds of questions that come up in the FOGO process I think are still relevant today and raise interesting ideas anyway about what we want to get from media in an age today when there's a new kind of remoteness and I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. So I'm just going to play some of these images in the background um, and speak uh, over them. These images have intrigued me since I first saw them played on one-inch videotape long ago in the basement of Memorial University of Newfoundland. They were taken on Fogo Island, Newfoundland, by the National Film Board of Canada in the late 1960s as part of its new program of film activities among the poor. The Fogo process, as it was known, was a series of experiments in the political uses of interactive film and video among remote populations. With the help of the National Film Board of Canada, Fogo Islanders produced a collective image of themselves and their social problems, and through this process, resisted resettlement of their island community and an imposed top-down modernization of their way of life. Today, these images are often recognized as the grandparent of more recent developments in participatory or community media. Forty years after the Fogo process, in the age of flip cameras, YouTube, and iPhones, when anyone anywhere can produce and distribute video. What can these images teach us about political collectivity and our ability to make and share images of ourselves? The characters in these films stand on the precipice of a new world order, where their highly localized ways of being would be replaced by new forms of circulation that only became more fluid and more global in scope. But the coming together of these kind of remote places, which the films anticipate, has itself given rise to new ways of being apart that are defined not so much or not only by physical boundaries, but by the decline of collective structures, the rise of a new kind of individualism, and in the background of all these changes, the separation of physical and virtual worlds. In this, our context, the FOGO process raises important questions about the politics of the image. What role can media now play to help us overcome our isolation from one another and to promote new forms of collectivity? The NFB's experiments, the NFB is the National Film Board of Canada, 
The NFB's experiments on FOGO are especially intriguing on this account since film was asked to do something extraordinary there, not simply to represent a people, but to help create them. How we understand newer forms of subject-generated media and what we look for in them depends in part on the genealogy of images we construct. With these thoughts in mind, I would like to offer some reflections on how I see our own present coming into being in the Fogel films. The Fogel process addressed problems of information poverty, which is what they called it, that affected remote populations who could not participate in decision-making structures that affected them. The problems they addressed were directly related to its status as a small coastal island in complex political and economic relations with another larger island, Newfoundland. Fogo Island is a remote part of Newfoundland, which is itself a remote part of Canada, uh, which was undergoing the twin forces of decolonization and modernization. So some brief comments on the social and political climate of Fogo are first in order to get a sense of why they chose Fogo and what was significant about it. In 1968, when these films were developed, uh, Fogo Island was undergoing changes not uncommon throughout the post-colonial world. Its economic and geographical separation had promoted a distinct sense of autonomy, with highly specific, the highly specific forms of dialect and lexicon, the range of specialized skills such as boat building, house construction, subsistence production, that had made it possible to eke out a living under the older feudal-like economic system that had emerged in Newfoundland all these elements that made Fogo so unique now in the late 60s were recast as obstacles to a new program of modernization with its mortgages and bought food, with wage labor and state-sponsored centralization. For the outlying islands around Newfoundland, it was a particularly difficult time. One solution to the problem of remoteness developed by the, just changing my image here, one second. One solution to the problem of remoteness developed by the Canadian and Newfoundland governments was the still deeply resented program of resettlement, which involved the forced movement of communities from isolated outports to growth centers, where modern infrastructure and factory-based wage labor employment were to be made available. In 1957, Premier Joey Smallwood announced plans to resettle as many as 50,000 people from remote settlements that, as he put it, had no great future. By 1965, more than 1,000 communities had been moved. Many of these were islands on the northeast and south coast of Newfoundland. By the late 60s, several smaller islands around Fogo had already been resettled. A powerful set of photographs, and in this case a video, from that time shows villagers floating their homes across the inlets and ocean channels to their new destinations. to their new destinations. In one especially poignant picture, a house sinks as floated from Deep Bay to Fogo proper, giving us a powerful metaphor for the villagers' attempts to integrate their lives into a new industrial future. Like many places on the margins, Fogo generated wealth that fueled an economic system that developed at a distance from it. So the way that the island was integrated into the world system accentuated its difference. And as a result, when the wealth that they had created and that had found its way to Europe and when the wealth that they had created came back to alter and affect them and change their ways of living, they were unable to understand or effectively resist it. The Fogo process, carried out by the National Film Board of Canada, is remarkable, first of all, for recasting this political economic problem of decolonization as a problem of communication, of information poverty, as they called it. We might note how forward-looking this was in development talk at the time and how it anticipates wider changes in the informatization of production and politics that were just becoming apparent at that time. But the excitement of these experiments at the NFB and the possibilities of media that they seem to open up also direct us to an important ambiguity in the very idea of communication as that was developing at the time uh, and which found a particularly interesting expression in these films. By communication, we might mean simply an exchange of information. And on this account, the task of the Fogel films was to promote better integration of bodies, images, and commodities in a new circulation of exchange. But communication, as it is developing at this time, also promised to teach us something about the nature of communicability itself, about mediality. I mean of how we live in media, 
how a self or a group forms through an image of itself. Communication might tell man something about himself, is how it's put at the time. This is by way of example, this is why, by way of example, in the very same year that the NFB sent film teams to Fogo, IBM hired Alan Watts, the 60s Zen guru, to lecture its scientists on the spiritual dimensions of information because communication was not only instrumental, but metaphysical in the broadest sense of the term. I am not a communication scholar, Marshall McLuhan declared at around the same time. I'm a metaphysician interested in the life of the forms. Communication was supposed to tell us something about the human condition. These two very different kinds of concerns then, the informatization of production and politics on the one hand, and a phenomenological insight, interest in the nature of communicability itself come together in interesting ways in the Fogel experiments, and it seems to me that they gradually come apart into different streams of participatory media as it develops through the next several decades. How we think about that history matters for our ability to appreciate the novelty of our own contemporary situation. To understand what was unique in the Fogel films, it helps to place them in the context of film history and different attempts to use film to promote uh, social change. Uh, even in its earliest beginnings, film had a sociological dimension uh, about it, a sociological importance, since it could present a mass of information about uh, details about distant places in a way more seemingly more immediate than print or other media. The Lumia brothers, the inventors of cinema, popularized their cinematograph in the 1890s by traveling around the world's major cities and displaying actualities which presented visual evidence of everyday life in other parts of the world. The Russian filmmaker Vertov thought it would be possible to develop a universal film language, Kino Pravda, that, unlike print-based media, would not be bound to particular languages or communities and would be intelligible to any viewer anywhere. In the same spirit, Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera, which should be coming up soon, was made with real people to document life in Russia. Later, Italian neorealists, Rossellini, De Sica, began to film live action in the streets based on scripts that addressed actual social and economic problems. Until the invention of small portable video cameras in the 1960s, though, the technical and financial demands of film tended to make it a centralizing force. Film images circulated from metropolitan centers to peripheral areas in a way that paralleled the commodity market. In remote places, the images provided information about distant worlds to which local populations were articulated through a complex political and economic circuitry. But they did not necessarily make the local situation more intelligible in relation to it or provide any significant resources for collective action. In fact, films arrived as preformed products whose origins were as mysterious as the frozen meals and mass-produced commodities that circled the globe with them. The Fogel process is a more complex phenomena of any, than any of the documentary forms that precede it because it was not only the informational content of the finished product, but the process of filmmaking itself that was employed as a tool of social change. This meant that it would not only provide a cognitive map of distant places to which Newfoundland was connected, the activity of filmmaking itself might, perform, might provide a form of collective action as well. In this way, the film, the Fogel experiments carried the mandate of the NFB, National Film Board of Canada, in new and interesting directions. The initial purpose of the NFB was to create films about social problems that would make Canada better known to Canadians. In the 1960s, though, there was a new interest in the NFB, not only to document social issues in communities, but to play an active role in them as well. In other words, Instead of an outside film industry making top-down films about people, could films be made by the people themselves about their social problems? The 1967 NFB film, The Things I Cannot Change, was one of the first films made in this new program, and it is often thought of as a forerunner of the films that were created on Fogo. It was a film meant to explain the social problems of poverty to a wide Canadian audience. The film documented the trials and tribulations of a Montreal family caught in a cycle of poverty. I'll just show you a minute of this film. You're gonna tell me there's justice. 
justice like my rear end when I was a kid was the same thing. They took me to my home and I begged them not to. I remember she told me how when, and uh, she hit her with the hammer and she tried to drown me in the bathtub and in the toilet. And you call it justice? I'm 39, you're 40 pretty soon. And I'm fed up with it. Oh, I beat him. I'm merciful all the time. I hit him with plungers, hammers. Oh, yeah. Plungers and everything. Bro broom. Break the broom over his back. Oh, she told me. Oh, I can't remember all she said. Yeah, and I just passed up like that out of a pool of blood. How often will a child go to somebody and tell them? And actually, a child, if, if it's taught and thought, maybe the child is telling the truth. But why don't it? When a child keeps running away and running away and running away and they keep taking them back and taking them back, there's got to be something wrong there. Kenneth and Gertrude Bailey have nine children, soon to be ten. A cook by trade, during the past two years, Kenneth Bailey has been working intermittently on the waterfront. What you're about to see is the undirected observation of the life of this family during a three-week period. Apparently the editor was standing like this when they were working on that film. It's tilted all aside. No, it's just a very bad copy. Uh, the things that I cannot change did not achieve its own goals. Oh, sorry. Uh, so it documented the trials and tribulations of a Montreal family caught in a cycle of poverty. When it appeared, it caused the family great embarrassment. This became a huge problem that everybody recognized who the family were and had all this inside history about them and ridiculed them and so on. When it appeared, it caused the family great embarrassment and they became the subject of ridicule in their own neighborhood. The things I cannot change did not achieve its own goals, but it did provide a future lesson for all, a, future, a valuable lesson for all future film activities among the poor. If film was to be a catalyst for social change, it would have to be not only about the poor, but by them as well. Producer and director Colin Lau, producer and director of the Fogo films, who headed up the Fogo team, wanted to give the people a more active opportunity to define and represent their social problems. A year after the things I cannot change, the NFB began its proposed film activities among the poor in Newfoundland. I'll just show you a minute with sound of uh, uh, the first of these films that they produced. It's not a very dynamic film, but nevertheless, it does its case. Challenge for Change is an experiment in the role of communications in social change. As part of this experiment, we filmed local people talking about the problems of the changing community and played back these films in that community. We chose Fogo Island as the location for this project for many reasons. The extension service of Memorial University in St. John's, Newfoundland is deeply involved with the needs of the Newfoundland people. One of its community development officers, Fred Earl, was born and raised on Fogo Island. He knows and is known by all its people. We felt that we, as outsiders, could never go into a community without the help of such a person. Fogo met other criteria for us as well. We wanted to involve ourselves with a community in trouble, and one whose problems are typical of other places, so the results of our project could be applied. Um, I'll talk more about the, what they actually did in the FOGO process uh, later in the questions in order to just jump ahead to other things I want to say here. The FOGO process was later exported, this model of bringing film equipment in and getting people to make films about themselves, was later exported with great success to North American indigenous reserves, rural India, Bangladesh, and other places. It's since been embraced by development agencies around the world and is now widely regarded as a forerunner of more recent developments in participatory or developmental communication. In Newfoundland, it led to all sorts of interesting media experiments that followed the 1970s. In Newfoundland, it spawned various offshoots, such as an educational television station with a remote, a portable remote transmitter. 
uh, a magazine, a video data bank connecting remote communities to one another where they would request tapes to be sent from one community to another that dealt with particular kinds of uh, social problems. Unfortunately, most of those projects are now defunct. Like many other socially useful developments, funding for them was cut in the mean 1990s when the university's mandate to provide service to the community was increasingly tied to entrepreneurial activities and business interests. If you help businesses, they will eventually help people. Apparently was the idea. That hasn't worked out yet. In Andhra Pradesh, Central India, a similar program led to the development of a filmmaking school of rural peasant women. I visited it a couple of years ago, quite an amazing uh, place. Um, uh, led to the development of a filmmaking school of rural peasant women who have effectively resisted the introduction of genetically engineered cotton into their region, have developed a green school, a world diversity fair, and other innovative developments that all circulate around this making of videotapes about their lives. So now I'm going to try to change, try to change gears and talk about other lines of dissent that come out of the Fogel films. One now well-documented line of dissent is the development image or the development video where the film conveys a political message. But I would like to pick up a second line of dissent I mentioned earlier, which ties back to this idea of the metaphysics of communication. We could call it the phenomenology of communication. What matters in this case is uh, not only that the image helped to do political work in new ways, but that the kind of political collectivity that transpired there threw new light on the nature of media. In short, showed us something about the mediality of human experience. In the Fogel films, as I mentioned earlier, these two forms, uh, these two kinds of interests in politics and phenomenology had a special affinity. Um, because the larger experiment was to see whether film could help people overcome their fragmented lives and to connect it together into some kind of common collective image. Uh, the idea was that the geographical isolation and economics of the so-called truck credit system that operated there pitted community against community and person against person so that there wasn't a sense of collectivity to resist external change. When communities needed to react against centralizing forces that treated a region or a community en masse, as it happened in Fogo, they had little collective sense of themselves to draw on. And I'll just show you, and this is a constant theme in the Fogel films, I'll just show you a little clip in which this idea of people being disconnected from one another, not knowing themselves, uh, is addressed. This will just be a moment. This is a typical kind of scene in these films. Here. Sure. You, you were saying something. Uh, my, I mean, what I was, point I was trying to get across is, why the fisherman is not organized. I mean, he, he never taught enough about it. You know, he wouldn't work well. Fishermen don't think he's enough about his subsidy. I mean, this all happened on our forefathers, you know. He never considered he was worth it, you know. And, and he never about it. And I guys... I don't know if you can make out what that man is saying, because his accent is very thick. The uh, Fogel accents are very thick. But what he's saying is that people are unable to organize because they don't know themselves. They've never thought about themselves. They've never, he doesn't know himself, is the phrase that he keeps coming back to. And this is precisely the kind of thing that they're trying to address through the films, to get people to know themselves and the collective nature of their problems, and in that way to form into some kind of a uh, unity. So the self-reflexive nature of film was important in this, and I'll just talk about a couple of instances in which this is discussed. Working in Deep Bay Fogo, extension worker Stan Kinden found that video playback had dramatic results in encouraging people to become collective. And I'm just quoting from uh, his report. The people in Deep Bay wanted to organize an improvement committee meeting, but they couldn't get anyone to stand up and speak. So they asked me to organize a workshop on public speaking, and I brought along VTR videotape. The first night, only five people would stand up and say as much as, I'm John Jones from Deep Bay. I played back the tape, and I think a lot of people were ashamed to see themselves sitting there not saying anything. The reaction was, if he can do it, I can. At the end of the third night, the last person got up and said their names. On the fifth night, we organized a mock meeting. The person who had taken three nights to say his name was the one who offered to be chairman. At this time, the Fogel experiment is starting to be used among different kinds of uh, social action groups or different kinds of groups who want to promote social change or use it for some specific kind of political and large sense purpose. And one of them is a psychologist, Anthony Marcus, who used the Fogo process of video feedback as a therapeutic treatment for dangerous sex offenders to get them to produce images of themselves and then watch the image of themselves and be transformed somehow by that. And so here's how Anthony Marcus describes that power of reflexivity in the creation of an image. Confronting himself on camera helps a person develop an internal image of himself. 
Most individuals have difficulty communicating their emotional hang-ups, but videotaping and the playback evoke a response on the emotional level. The simple device of reflecting an image magnifies the individual's self-image. The emotional dilemma induced by the gap between the image on screen and the subjective feeling of the viewer produces a crisis in which the person attempts to bring the two aspects into harmony, thus increasing his self-knowledge. Now, now, with these thoughts in mind, let's jump ahead and consider a more contemporary kind of participatory media. There are many that follow the model of a social animator who helps organize and articulate a community. But the general backdrop for much of communication now is a more lonely kind of individualism defined by the collapse of collapse of, struct defined by the collapse of collective structures and the welfare state funding uh, that made uh, efforts like the FOGO process possible. What we get instead now is the emergence of a virtual space that is often in conflict with a physical one for attention, in the very least. A new kind of aloneness, a new sort of remoteness, now locks us into a kind of separateness, not based on geographical separation, but on the separation of virtual and physical worlds. No matter how dazzling the wizardry of 3D screens or teledildonics, it nevertheless requires time away from the physical face-to-face -face contact with others. By now, everyone has seen a room of children physically together, but spiritually alone with their screens. In fact, there was a picture of one earlier today. The image, of course, plays a central driving force that both represents this world and is its condition of possibility. Paul Virilio has noted that public space has formed around the transmission of material goods. As we move into an information age, we also need less of that kind of publicly shared collective space. If the decline of an older, more solid modernity individualizes us, whether we want it to or not, the task now is to know how we might render something collective and therefore political from our other highly individualized lives. It's common to understand the emergence of virtuality in a narrative of loss. We gain the screen and lose community. But should we judge the participatory potential of new media in terms of how well they can replicate an older idea of community? Should we let the dead bury the living, as Nietzsche puts it? My impulses take me in the other direction, and I would suggest that the political dimension of not much new media uh, does not or does not only lie in any manifestly political content, but in new experiences of collectivity that it makes possible. Much of the new wave of online video sharing, of those kinds that involve user-generated content, are also explorations in self-reflection that are interesting for this matter of collectivity. The Fogel films, as I said earlier, suggest to us that the significance may not lie in any message that they represent, but in the ability to draw a community uh, together, in the way that the image plays a role in the creation of collective experience. In this respect, we stand to learn a lot from the new connections that emerge in the otherwise lonely spaces of the internet. To my mind, the most interesting forms, then, on this account, are not the artistically dazzling, though they are great, and we have seen many here uh, over the weekend, nor the ideologically driven that convey a particular political message, but the more humbler and awkward kinds of image sharing that we find in things like the amateur blog, vlog, with its confessional, self-referential form and its concern to document, to document the most mundane encounter with self and other. The American anthropologist James Wesch, who is trying to create an anthropology of video sharing, the American anthropologist James Wesch has identified an important set of contradictions that accompany the spread of video sharing. They are, he points out, addressed to everyone and no one in particular. So uh, they are not efforts to create a specific community with a geographical focus like FOGO, but they address anyone who is able to see or hear, or to connect at any rate. The anonymity, the physical distance, the ephemeral nature of these messages conveyed makes it possible to experience the other without fear or anxiety. And it is precisely this anonymous, contextless fashion in which we receive images of others now, uh, in which we confront ourselves and others through the shared video image that offers us new, sight, in new insights into how to be a person, into what it is to be one anyway. Consider these examples that he, Wesh, has joined together in a popular online video that you can watch called An Introduction to YouTube. And these are instances of self-reflexive 
amateur confessional vlog type video images. Again, the most mundane kind of thing that you can find, but interesting with this respect. Interesting, but without sound. I don't know why it doesn't have sound. Hopefully it will come on. My name's Jessie. And I feel like I should put a picture of a person right here. You know, maybe an eye. It would be so much better if this thing blinked and smiled, responded to what I said. Uh, the seventh time I've tried to take this. So I am in my closet. Um, I feel a little strange out in the family room, just talking to what seems like myself. So don't really know what to talk about. What do people talk about their first vlogs? I mean, what do people talk about anyway? Uh, <laughs> Beautiful. Man, I totally blazed past actually introducing myself. Um, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, my name's, oh yeah, my name is Melissa, by the way, um, and I'm a college student, college student, enunciate, um, uh, so we're just going to talk, okay? <laughs> and to tell you the truth, I actually spent about five minutes deciding how I was going to work my hair back her up all forming this identity and this new mask to my new um, What is collective in these images? Not any particular kind of information in them, not simply in the fact that they are shared, but in the way that they reveal a certain kind of an encounter with an image. I'll just say a few words about this now by way of conclusion. The awkwardness in these videos reveals a divide between ourselves and the images in which we come to form an understanding of what we share in common with others. What I would like to suggest is what is collective in them is this experience of a division between what we understand ourselves to be and the image in which that must come to life, must transpire in some way. If we follow Lacan, for example, our ideas of unity and coherence depend upon an external image in which our other fragment, otherwise fragmented selves can cohere. For Lacan, that means that the ego is born in a moment of alienation. Every representation we make of ourselves simultaneously speaks of its inadequacy, that we're in truth somewhere else, not caught up in that image. So the image in which we identify is both fascinating and inadequate, compelling and inadequate. The availability of anonymous, self-conscious images like this then has a special importance. It allows us to suspend any practical or instrumental concern with the other, and to direct our interest instead to the way that they come to present themselves through an image of themselves. To have, to, to have oneself or the other available for consideration in a non-threatening and non-instrumental way opens a new moment in our relation to our own humanity. This is how I would suggest subject-generated video is political in its most elementary form. It is a commonplace that the virtual image allows me to use the other without concern for her response. The image requires nothing of me. I make use of it. This leads eventually to a complaint about the false and ultimately objectifying nature of the image, of which the pornographic image is perhaps the ideal form. But it is precisely the decontextualized, anonymous, and random character of these images uh, that allows me insight and lets me see the other, or myself for that matter, in the struggle to surmount that gap between self and image, between self and the image that it must live under. This is what I would suggest is important in males. Giorgio Agamben has summarized a similar kind of dilemma in this way. The subject, he writes, is not something that can be directly attained as a substantial reality present in some place. On the contrary, it is what results from the encounter and from the hand-to-hand -hand confrontation with the apparatuses in which it has been put and has put itself into play. Subjectivity must show itself and increase its resistance at the point where its apparatuses capture it and put it into play. A subjectivity is produced where the living being, 
encountering language or an image, encountering language and putting itself into play in language without reserve, exhibits in a gesture, this is the important thing, exhibits in a gesture the impossibility of its being reduced to that gesture. If this is true, then the image is impersonal in, in some important way, and this helps us to understand its collective nature. I see in the image the impossibility of my being reduced to this image. Why is this collective? Because it is not a personal insight. It is an insight into something impersonal, pre-individual, that is taking, the taking place in me of a collective, I would say, species-like characteristics, in the sense that Marx talks about species being as, some, as a, a recognition of the universal in my own personal experience. We come to life through the confrontation with some image. That comes to me as part of being a person. And this is the most general quality that I share with others. Before any geographical, economic, or manifestly political concern, just this, just this inadequacy of the image. So oddly, perhaps, we now, in the age of shared subject-generated video, have the most intimate encounters with what is most exterior to us. How can it be, I'll finish in one moment, how can it be that the anonymous image offers intimacy? There is a whole sociology of intimacy that suggests that bureaucratization does not destroy human closeness, but in fact creates it in new and interesting ways. Nicholas Luhmann, Ulrich Beck, Anthony Giddens, and others have all shown in very different ways that the bureaucratization of life does not destroy intimacy, but creates it as its opposite, as an island of reality in the center of a highly artificial world. It may only be in a highly instrumentalized world that allows us to distinguish a non-instrumental interest in self-exploration through love and friendship, or the examples that Beck and uh, Lumen are interested in, from the numerous instrumentalized ways in which we encounter others. The anonymity of the YouTube image of the amateur vlog makes this possible in new and interesting ways and helps us to consider how virtuality may not destroy community, but in fact may make it possible. I'll end there. Wow, it's really dark uh, all of a sudden. Any questions? Not that I can see your hands, but... Shall I start again? I am... Um, ah, thank you. Yeah, I'm still wondering on how to phrase the question. I was just um, wondering about the sort of paradoxal uh, role you see for uh, video, or maybe for video making, like on the one hand it can create and, and uh, or create participation and even community. On the other hand, you talk about how we are now in a new remoteness, a new aloneness. Um, like is, is, is video the, the answer to all this, or who has to take up this whole responsibility of community building? How is that? Uh, I think we all have some kind of desire for community and connection to others or to have some kind of a common experience of what our humanity is. Uh, I also think that you know one needs to be historical and social and political about that and over the course of the last 30 or 40 years we see the decline of many kind of collective structures that we share in common, the kind of a decline of a kind of collectively shared public space in North America at any rate, I don't know I imagine the situation is the same in Europe from what I know of it, from reading about it. Uh, in that kind of world, and it requires new sort of work to know how to be with others, how to share some kind of sense of collectivity. At the same time, through those 30 or 40 years, you have all sorts of waves of globalization that break down barriers, connections, geographical and one sort for, from, between people and allow new kinds of connection. But that itself is tied to the emergence of a society of the image, of screens. So the kind of connections that we have with people all over the place are screen-based, are virtual, are textual. They're very different from an older kind of physical face-to-face -face space. One common kind of reaction to that is then that that must mean that there is no community anymore. Now children are living on screens, they're not living with one another. You go to birthday parties, if anyone has children, you'll, you'll know this scenario. You go to birthday parties and they are not 
playing games together in the same way that we played games as a light shining my eyes there when we were kids. So one, can, one you know, reaction to that could be that they're not being together anymore. But they also have this whole new strange phenomenological experience with others where they're sharing these contextless images of somebody sitting in their bedroom reflecting on uh, how they have prepared themselves for the image or how they have to get into the closet to speak to the computer because they don't want people in the other room to know and so on. And so there you see someone coming to life in an image. And I think that there's something profound and powerful about that. They're not coming to life in an image that is caught up in some narrative of a film where the image is in the service of a message or a narrative, but it is some kind of a pure into exploration, communication with an image that we learn something about how to be a person. Now, we don't care what she's saying. What matters is that she is describing some kind of an inadequacy, a, necess uh, a necessity to present herself through an image, but simultaneously an impossibility of being in it. And that's something profoundly human. We learn something about being a human being in that. So then, what would it have looked like if the Fogo Islanders had been equipped with cameras? Like. Um, well, they were. I mean, I think that this is the connection to the FOGO experiments, that these are early experiments in giving people equipment so that they can share some collective image of themselves, not only in an instrumental way that they can make a movie of, here is what my community is like, but somehow or another, through the sharing of images with one another, they will have a sense of, aha, this is what it is like to be her. And I know that this is what it is like to be me, and there's some kind of commonality among those two. So it's really a phenomenological insight into what it is to be a person. Uh, thanks, Stephen, for that. I thought that was uh, uh, really interesting. And um, it, it nicely kind of bookended, I think, with what I was saying first thing this morning was, and one of my concerns was that um, about the shift, an interesting shift from, from films as commodities to people as commodities in um, online video participatory culture. And I, I just wonder with your emphasis on subjectivity, if we also need to hang on to you know, objectivity in the sense that objectifying ourselves in this way um, is, is I can see in some senses it, it might be a, a liberation and of intimacy and new levels of intimacy and what it might be like to be, how to be a person. But also my concern is, um, I think as I was arguing this morning, is might it also be seen as a, a kind of a, a, a deepening of modernity, of consumerism, you know, in, in terms of the expense of that, it's we have to commodify ourselves as as objects in that way. So I just wonder whether those things can be, it's a dialectical image, I guess, but I just wonder what your thoughts were. Uh, yeah, that's important. I mean, we need to distinguish among kinds of images that are being shared. So some certainly are commodities, but I, I would want to be more precise about what I meant by a commodity. So for me, a, a commodity that is an, uh, an item that is in a system of exchange for buying and selling. It's a market-driven uh, uh, entity so that the exchange system is in the service of the accumulation of surplus value or something. That's a, a distinct kind of system of exchange. That's different than an exchange of... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so it's, it's the creation of a, a symbolization of oneself that's then put into some kind of circulation of exchange. And what's interesting about that is that we all have to do that. We all have to create symbols of ourselves and connect them and share them around and so on. That's, that's the only way there is to really to be a person, to know what it is that I am as a subject. I have to become objectified in something and then I can see myself objectified in the thing that I produce. I'd say that that's a basic property of being a person. In Marx, I mentioned that this is a species characteristic. That may seem like a, a crazy thing to say, but in the Marxian idea of species being is really based on this idea that 
I need to objectify myself in things in the world. My labor has to transform something, and then I see myself reflected in that thing that I have transformed. But then, at another level, I can see that my ability to see myself transformed, by see myself reflected in the thing that I have transformed, is given to me by my humanity and everybody else, no matter what it is that they're doing in their labor, no matter what they are transforming or changing, is doing something like that, and they too are able to see themselves reflected in the things that they produce. So I think that the same thing happens in the level of symbols. Everybody produces a symbol to manifest themselves in the world. That symbol is inadequate in some way. I come to a confrontation with that. I know I have this ridiculous mandate. I am Steve Crocker. I have to live under that sign. It's inadequate. I'm more or less than that or someone, something. But it's not just a personal insight. That's an insight into something that's given to me by virtue of the fact that I'm a human being and that connects me. That's the experience of collectivity that I think is possible. And the more generalized the circulation of images, the more possible that becomes. The more it is disconnected from particular practices, narratives, geographical situations, the more general and impersonal the image becomes, then the more possible it becomes to see in that gap between the person and the image in which they manifest themselves in the world. Hi, I, uh, I didn't know why I was thinking about Ludwig Wittgenstein during your presentation because it is really not very related. But then I realized now actually why I was thinking about it. I think the reason was uh, uh, his concept of private language. And I was thinking that basically maybe he, uh, we have this moment. I mean, Wittgenstein was thinking uh, in most of his thesis that we are actually just trying to explain to each other our misunderstandings and that basic language is a lot about this, maybe 90% is about trying to explain misunderstandings. And I was thinking that maybe it's like here is also in your presentation uh, a possible, we can see it as a possible example how actually these new kids are jumping from the from the pure uh, like private language situation to video sharing as a, as a maybe new concept of, of private language which is uh, done by technological means, actually. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, the idea of private language in Wittgenstein, I mean, it's, it's interesting and directly connected to this notion of the sharing of symbols that I was talking about. And Wittgenstein's thesis is that there, is, there can never be a private language. A language by virtue of the fact that it is a language is a system of signs that are connected and shared to other people. And so in the attempt to create a private set of signs, you confront that dilemma. There isn't a sign that adequately represents me unless it's one that can be shared with other people. So the sign has an impersonal quality about it. I don't possess it, but I have to live under it. That's always the dilemma. That's the Lacanian dilemma as well, that to come to life, to be a thing, I've got to be able to be represented in something outside of me. I know I'm not that thing, but that is the only game that I can play. I have to live under that sign and be aware of its inadequacy. Recognizing the social nature of that then frees us from that as a small-scale personal kind of dilemma. I, I'm not trying to advocate Lacanian psychoanalysis or anything like that from anybody. I mean, they, I think that insight, that Lacanian insight, is one that you find in lots of places, in Marx, in Lacan, uh, lately in Agamben, and so on. The same kind of dilemma. Agamben says that the subject shows it's through a gesture, it's impossibility of being reduced to a gesture. There must be a gesture. There must be some way in which you become manifest in the world, but any way that there is, is also inadequate. So there's always that gap between what it is that I am and what it is that could present me in the world. Thank you very much. Oh. Turning this gap into a fetish, I mean, because once we keep relying on, on this gap, it's like, well, then there's that, that's where I really am. Yes, I really am in that in that gap. So, oh, there's you know there's this misidentification, but I'm really over there. So you know, uh, I, I can at least feel 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 fine about that. So somehow residing, resi you know, always you know, oh, it's the gap, it's the gap. Then somehow somehow that becomes a symptom of you know of a, a fear of something else. Isn't it? Yeah, that is definitely a problem. I, w I wouldn't deny that that's a problem. I mean, the only qualification I would add is that one never gets to the gap, that the gap always has to be presented in some kind of an image, and so it's always the confrontation with an image that makes that experience possible, and it's the inadequacy of it. But again, there has to be an image. One has to make a name. One has to live under a sign. There's no getting away from that. So maybe we should take a chance. I don't seriously mind the gap. Be aware. 
Right, but also that the gap is not a personal thing, right? The gap is a recognition of some collective kind of experience that we all have, uh, and that we miss that when we recognize ourselves as having an, ad an adequate kind of symbol that presents us in the world. The most general thing we share with one another, Marx has this great line, he says, um, uh, you know, what is man's species being? Uh, other animals or species being is defined by their manner of vital activity, how they conduct themselves in the world. Man is not immediately identical with any of his characterizations. There have to be characterizations, there have to be ways in which you build houses, labor, dress, so on, but none of them define us as humanity. Humanity is that distance from any of the characterization. <laughs> Sorry to pull that out of your hands. Thank you very much, Stephen Kroger. I just got...